chance yet to look at the book that's sitting in front of you uh, called The Senior. Uh, the, the book is actually the product of the work of a lot of people. But uh, there's one man here tonight uh, who really is first, if not uh, more than equal, among the many people who worked on it. And he is a member of a family who was just given honorable mention a little earlier in one of our awards for the families that go back the farthest. But what wasn't mentioned was that he is the son of Jim Hinkle, who goes back really the farthest. He's the only one who can truly claim that he's sailing a boat, at least the namesake of a boat, that was racing in 1914. And that wouldn't be such a great thing for him to work for the fact that he's lived up to it very well. And we want to award Joe Hinkle tonight an, an award which is hard to describe, but uh, the category is for doing the most to preserve the tradition of the Wiano Senior. And to go through the many things which uh, Jody has done uh, is, it, it would, would put uh, even the best uh, intention of us to sleep. He's been so busy. But I would like to mention, first of all, that the editorial work on the book before you is mostly Jody's. The format is his. The uh, vision of this fleet covering 75 years uh, was his, uh, at least presenting it the way it's been presented. And I think this book will, will uh, become an important part of this class's uh, tradition in the future. It's, it's all we've got, really, to, to uh, reach back with before many of us were sailing. Uh, in addition, he has brought back to life the what I think may be one of the very oldest trophies in competition on the East Coast today, the 1920 Crossit Trophy, which was awarded for the Wiano to Egertown race for the first time in 40 years to, uh, just last week. And uh, I would say uh, is well-deserving himself, in spite of the fact that he's Jim Hinkle's son of his own award. So I would like to present a final award of the evening to Joe Hinkle. things. One, 
people willing to break into this fleet, and second, the rest of us who put up with them. <laughs> taking a turn at 200 miles an hour and the wind kicks up, you better be ready for it. If you're informed, if you're smart, you're aggressive, winner takes all. Without up-to-date information, you can't be accurate. Without up-to-date information, you cannot succeed. Toys R Us needed a computer company that could help them serve their customers best at the most difficult and demanding times. Online transaction processing from digital allows them to offer a perpetual selection of toys, faster checkout, and has helped them become the largest toy retailer in the world. High in the picturesque Swiss Alps, Little has changed in 300 years. For the people who live here, life is much the same as it was for their fathers and their fathers before them. But in recent years, the inhabitants of this alpine village have begun to worry about their famous tourist attraction, the Grindelwald Glacier. The vast sheet of ice straddling the eastern slope of the Eiger is gradually disappearing. Inch by inch, the glacier is melting. Switzerland is a city of medieval architecture, of literature and science. Hans Erschke is no stranger to the mystery of the glaciers. Thirty years ago, he began to wonder about the climate. Could the glaciers be melting because the Earth's temperature is rising? Could the climate be changing? Erschke knew the answer lay hidden in the past. Here at the University of Bern, he and his colleagues pioneered the technique of retrieving fossil air from ancient ice. Today, he is one of the world's leading authorities on the greenhouse effect. Judy, I'm here, it's all in order. I'm going to the lab. It's good. The laboratory contains some 2,000 ice cores from glaciers around the world. For Erschke, coping in sub-zero temperatures is all in a day's work. <laughs> Glaciers form when winter snow doesn't melt the following summer. With each successive snowfall, the old snow is compressed until it finally turns to ice. Trapped inside are bubbles of air, tiny moments of antiquity that preserve the atmosphere from long before the dawn of civilization. The oldest cores come from polar regions where snow has steadily accumulated since the ice ages. In 1971, an international team of scientists began drilling on the Greenland ice cap. It was a colossal feat of engineering, but the results were spectacular.
By 1981, they had drilled to a depth of more than a mile. Eventually, the core would span some 12,000 years. Fragments of the core were carefully preserved and cataloged before they began the 5,000-mile journey to burn. The cores date back to the end of the last ice age, when the Earth began to gradually warm. Ersker's team wanted to find out if there had also been a change in the chemistry of the atmosphere. To do so, they will measure the amount of carbon dioxide and methane, gases that trap heat in the atmosphere. Before the cores can be analyzed, the ice is shaved to remove any contamination. To release the bubbles of fossil air, the core is then put into a vacuum chamber and crushed. Oeschger and his team have now analyzed thousands of samples, and the results are startling. Chemical analysis reveals the origin of the carbon dioxide to be man-made. Since mankind began burning fossil fuels to power the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide has increased 25%. Methane has doubled. Climate records show an increase in global temperature over the past 200 years. From the analysis of ice cores, Ershka found that the rise in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere corresponds dramatically to the rise in global temperature. For Ershka, the implications are profound. What uh, man is doing, actually changing the atmosphere, that is happening now, and that's something which will uh, lead uh, most probably to significant climatic changes in the next uh, 100 years or so. Ancient air, trapped in ice, has given us a sobering glimpse of the past. But what can it tell us about the future? At the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, scientists are peering into the 21st century to see if the current increase in greenhouse gases could change the climate. Here, the complex interactions that occur in the atmosphere are reduced to mathematical equations. Because climate cannot be reproduced in a laboratory, a machine simulates nature. A powerful computer can calculate a year of weather in hours. The result? A dynamic, three-dimensional model of the Earth's climate. By manipulating the factors that influence climate, scientists have created a crystal ball to look into the next century. Climatologist Steven Schneider has seen the future. He is concerned about the increase in carbon dioxide and how it could affect the weather. All of us have had the experience of feeling warm and cold days. We know one day can be 10 or even 20 degrees different from the day before. Well, that weather change is very large. Against that background where we live locally and think from day to day, how can we fathom what a 3 degree Celsius or a 5 degree Fahrenheit change is for the globe and over many decades? Well, the computer can actually help us uh, understand that. In the lower panel, we're looking at a sequence of weather for normal. That means today's climate. Red is warmer. In this case, it means weather that's 10 degrees Fahrenheit or 6 degrees Celsius warmer than average, and blue is, is colder by 10 Fahrenheit or 6 Celsius. 
The upper panel is for a world that in the computer has carbon dioxide doubled, and that world is something like about uh, 5 degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Well, let's take a look in motion what happens. Now, notice that down below, roughly equal amounts of hot and cold days, whereas in the CO2 doubled world, there's still some cold snaps coming across, but that the likelihood or probability of having warm is greater. We're still going to get weather systems coming and going. We're still going to have cold days in the winter, but the probability of getting red is much higher than it is in the normal weather, and the probability of getting blue is lower. But still, people are going to feel weather systems come and go in the future as well as in the present. The difference is we're going to have more extreme heat waves, fewer extreme cold waves, more droughts, and this can be very significant for forests, other natural ecosystems, for water supplies, for agriculture, human health, and so forth. For billions of years, the average temperature of Earth remained stable and life-supporting because of the natural greenhouse effect. The sun's energy comes to Earth as visible and ultraviolet light. Eventually, it is released back into the atmosphere as radiant heat. Gases such as carbon dioxide and methane trap the outgoing heat, keeping the planet warm. But as man-made greenhouse gases increase, the temperature goes up and the natural balance is threatened. Very often people in the public are confused about the greenhouse effect or any other complicated issue. For example, in the newspaper or on the television, they hear one expert who says this is catastrophic and we have to reform our ways immediately. And then somebody else, usually from an affected industry, who says, but there's a lot of uncertainty and we shouldn't do anything. That's a kind of thing that leads to paralysis. After all, if the experts don't know, how can I know? Very often what's not reported is that there's a spectrum of opinion and that the media have grabbed the edges. They've grabbed the extreme and the extreme. And what, what's missing is that there's a vast bulk of knowledgeable and responsible people who don't believe it's either totally catastrophic or to be ignored, but that it's a problem in the middle, say an even odds of substantial change. And if the public knew that, and they knew that that was what the majority of people think, and my belief is that is what the majority of knowledgeable scientists think about global warming, then they'd be much more willing to take measured actions to slow it down and buy time so that we can adapt more easily and understand what we're doing. Quite simply, we're insulting the environment faster than we understand what we're doing, and under those circumstances, surprises, many of them nasty, are virtually guaranteed. Some of the surprises could be devastating. Consider this. By the end of the next century, a gradually warming planet could lead to the slow but relentless melting of the polar ice caps. As water is released into the world's oceans, sea levels rise. Storms increase in intensity. Low-lying urban areas are swamped. The familiar map of the planet is dramatically redrawn as seas surge across the land, creating new geographic outlines. Many of the world's major capitals are inundated, disrupting the flow of government. Fertile, crop-producing regions are reduced to desert. Agricultural patterns shift. Food supplies are severely threatened. Grain reserves in the industrial world dry up. No longer able to export food to an already impoverished third world, famine increases on an epidemic scale. starvation. In a world of rapidly changing climate, familiar habitats begin to disappear. Entire ecosystems collapse. Planet Earth would be a very different place.
Sometime between 15,000 and 5,000 years ago, the planet warmed up 5 Celsius, that's 9 Fahrenheit. Sea levels rose 300 feet. Forests moved. Literally, that change of 5 degrees revamped the ecological face of this planet. Uh, species went extinct. Others grew. It took nature about 10,000 years to do that. That's the natural rate of change, if you will, for large changes in the system. We're talking about five degrees change as sort of a mid-guess for the middle to the end of next century as a better than even bet from our climate models. But this time it's taking place in one century, not 10,000 years. So we're talking about change that could be as much as 100 times faster than nature. It's that rate of change that has me worried and that I believe the models are credible in projecting, not the details, because when you change that fast, you're almost guaranteed to have surprises. Raid contacts and kills all kinds of bugs indoors. Raid hunts them down like radar. Aerosol spray cans first made their appearance in the 1950s because of a remarkable new chemical. Kills them dead. Called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. They were chosen because they were thought to be harmless to the atmosphere. Originally developed as a coolant, CFCs were commonly known as Freemont. Now, everyone could own a refrigerator. Outrageous stunts introduced the latest models. But even greater claims were made for the substance that made it all possible. Considered safe, they were odorless, non-flammable, and non-toxic. CFCs were marketed aggressively and propelled everything from deodorants to insecticides to food additives. They were truly wonder chemicals. Still in use today, mainly as a solvent for cleaning electronic parts and a coolant for air conditioners, CFCs were just too good to be true. But were they as safe as their manufacturers claimed? In 1973, a chemist at the University of California in Irvine made some simple calculations. Because CFCs have a long lifespan, Sherry Rowland wondered where they were going. What were they doing to the atmosphere? Rowland knew CFCs were harmless in the lower atmosphere, but what if they drifted into the upper atmosphere? Every chemist knew the molecular structure of CFCs and how they reacted to ultraviolet radiation. Soon, he sensed that something was very wrong. Roland and his associate, Mario Molina, calculated that CFCs would not be as harmless as thought. Chemically, they would be deadly to the Earth's ozone layer. In the upper atmosphere, a layer of natural ozone protects the Earth from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. As CFCs drift above the ozone layer, Harsh ultraviolet radiation breaks the molecules apart, releasing chlorine. When chlorine comes in contact with ozone, it robs it of an oxygen atom, destroying the molecule and forming a new one, chlorine monoxide. Reacting to a stray oxygen atom, the molecule becomes unstable and breaks apart. The chlorine is released, beginning a chain reaction. A single chlorine atom can destroy up to a hundred thousand molecules of ozone. When the two scientists announced their findings, many stopped using aerosols, but industry largely ignored them. In December of 1973, I came home one day and my wife asked me, how is the work going? And I said, it's really going very well but it looks like we may see the end of the world. In 
1978, five years after Rowland's prediction, NASA launched a Nimbus satellite to study the Earth's natural resources. It would also monitor the ozone layer. By the early 1980s, its instruments began to record abnormally low concentrations above the Antarctic. While the satellite continued to orbit the Earth, researchers at the British Antarctic base at Halley Bay were measuring ozone in the skies above the South Pole. They began to detect a drop in the readings. By 1985, Chief Researcher Joseph Farman decided to publish the findings. He was convinced that there was a hole in the ozone layer. Ironically, the readings from the satellite were so low, the information had been ignored. Farman's discovery would force NASA to reevaluate their data. Atmospheric chemist Robert Watson thought that there had been an error. We thought that the data was in some way flawed, that it was basically wrong. So we rejected the notion that there really was a hole in the Antarctic ozone shield. After Joe Farman reported observing the ozone hole, the scientists at NASA Goddard went back to their satellite data and started to look at it with much more scrutiny. Hi, Mark. What you got? Oh, hi. This is really interesting here. At the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, scientists compared the early readings to the latest satellite data. The proof was there. A hole had been torn in the ozone layer. Seen here in black against an outline of Antarctica, the ozone hole is now larger than the continental United States. To find out what was causing the hole, NASA dispatches its converted U-2 spy plane to the upper atmosphere to bring back air samples. A DC-8 flying laboratory will explore the lower regions of the ozone layer. High above the frozen wastes of the Earth's most desolate continent, instruments pick up vast quantities of man-made CFCs and traces of chlorine monoxide, or CLO, which trigger ozone destruction. A smoking gun had been found. Sherry Rowland was right. Robert Watson. We believe that the ozone hole over the South Pole is primarily caused by man-made chlorine. As we flew south from...